Kathy Vaness. I'm the general manager of the Golden Door, and I'm proud to be here with my friend, who I've talked to so many times, Dr. Brian Keating, who is an astrophysicist at UCSD Center for Astrophysicists and Space Scientist. He's one of the leaders of a collaboration responsible for building telescopes and ob observatories, and wait to hear more about this, that allow physicists for the first time to measure gravitational waves. I know we're like on Tuesday Spa, but trust me, I'm going to make this <laughs> really interesting. That emanated from the universe from the first moments of creation. This is going to be fun. I know, right? <laughs> this is going to be fun. So we had to like really put together questions to cover a broad source of subject. We're covering time, we're covering black holes, and we're covering some just fun universe questions. So enjoy yourself. This is going to be about 30 minutes, and let's have some fun. You know, Dr. Keating, during our last talk, about the mysterious universe, you mentioned there's a startling possibility that our cosmos might just be the most insignificant speck of what is now called the multi-universe. Yeah. Can you explain? <clears throat> yeah, we've been thinking about the implications of our research and how it seems to be that there's nothing that forbids there from being another universe that's potentially, you know, comparable in size and shape and whatnot to our universe. and the. The reasoning is not too dissimilar to what Galileo and Copernicus went through. They said the Earth is a planet like another planet. The sun is a star like any other star. We now know there are billions, literally hundreds of billions of galaxies. The Milky Way is not unlike those other hundred billion galaxies. So why not take this logic one step further and say perhaps it might be that our universe is not the only universe that there is. So it's the ultimate gambit, if you will, that we shouldn't have that great a cosmic ego after all. I know. Yeah. It's, uh, well, and I'm going to talk about your telescope in a minute, <laughs> yeah. but I'm going to get us warmed up sure. on some astounding things because yeah. I love, gosh, I want to be an astrophysicist <laughs> at least a day. What's the most astounding fact you could share with us tonight about the universe? I think what's, what's so you know, uh, unusual and so interesting to me is that what we're able to do now is not just answer questions about you know what will happen what will happen you know millions of years from now but what happened in the earliest moments of the universe and we're at this precipice when we actually may know in our lifetimes i always like to say you know if i could ask god or you know if you like nature one question it would be what happened 15 minutes before the big bang you know 15 minutes before the universe started nice. does that even make sense is there such a concept of time and my research now is really revolving around this question of whether or not we can know why time goes in one direction. We always think about, we have this ability to walk left, you guys hike up these beautiful rolling hills and mountains around here, and you can choose to turn back if it's too strenuous, although many of the people here are so physically fit, they go all the way up. But if you wanted to, you could come back. Why can't we do that in time? Why can't we say, I wanna go back in time to when I was 18, or why is it impossible? And if so, can the universe, if you will, be run backwards in time? What would that look like? And we're just now beginning to answer that quantitatively with data. Well, you've <coughs> invented, I'm gonna skip around a bit if you'll let me. I think we need to understand, Dr. Keating has a telescope that's living in South America, mm -hmm. Chile, right? Yep, that's right. In the, one of the driest deserts in the world, that's correct. because that's good for telescopes. Yep. I learn something every day. <laughs> now you guys have learned with me. And the telescope sees backwards mm -hmm. in time. That's right. Share that yeah. with my our guests. What's interesting, another, another really um, amazing scientific fact that Galileo, the great maestro, the master of, of, of science, the first physicist realized is that when you look back in space, you're looking back in time. Light travels the fastest velocity of anything that's known to all of science, but that speed is not infinite. It's a fixed number, many people know it. My kids always like to tell me exactly what it is, 186,000 miles per second. So that's really fast. That means when people landed on the moon, we could communicate with the astronauts, we'd say hello. And then a second and a half later, 250,000 miles, about a second and a half, even traveling at the speed of light. The implications uh, of that knowledge, that fact that Einstein proposed, nothing can go faster than that. So if you look at something that is one foot away, you can convert 186,000 miles per second to feet per second, and it turns out to not even be a foot, not even be an inch, not even be a millimeter. It's one billionth of a foot, or if you like, in one nanosecond, light travels one foot. So this, this far back from me, you'll look one nanosecond younger. 
So usually when I tell people of a certain age that they can be you know, younger by one nanosecond, they'll start to move back farther and farther. Well, let me, let me <coughs> go back though and say that you have this telescope in Chile, mm -hmm. and it's been there for how long now? This one's been there for four years. So for four years? Yes, correct. And so you have yourself and scientists to go down there right. and you look through it? We don't actually look through these types of telescopes. What these telescopes do is they synthesize. I ask these really like questions <laughs> like you can actually understand. If you know. <laughs> <laughs> when you look at the data from these telescopes, we're not looking at light. There are telescopes. But if you're, if you're seeing from the second of the Big Bang, yes. right? Mm -hmm. What do you see? You see a pattern of not light, not even radio waves like we see. It's a pattern of heat. It's a pattern of thermal, a thermal image, uh, if you will. But since heat goes through basically everything, you can cover your eyes, put your, put your hand in front of the sun, and you can still feel the heat, maybe even see the sun through your hand even. So heat can propagate very far, great distances, and the farther you go in space, the farther back you're looking in time. And so that's the basic principle. So we make maps of what the human eye can't see, the invisible but it's there, it's real, and we know that it exists. And by making those images, we learn about what the universe looked like when it was a baby. I say I take the ultimate you know, baby pictures of the universe. Well, and is it, is, is it now scientifically a fact and not a theory that the Big Bang was the creation of the universe? So, Because there is a controversy on whether it's fact or theory still. Yeah, so when we talk about theories in science, there's no such thing as absolute proof. Um, I was talking with people earlier today, uh, what is the nature of proof in, in science as opposed to math? So it's possible in math, and we've discussed this before, you can prove that one plus one equals two. It seems, you know, I try to do that with my three-year-old and my five-year-old, right? And they can grasp one plus, but actually to prove that to a standard that a mathematician will accept, it requires about 200 pages of dense mathematics, and, and, and it's quite sophisticated to do that at that level. In science, you can't do that. You can't prove something exists or doesn't exist to a level of certainty that you can in math that three angles uh, add together to make a triangle. It doesn't exist. So what we do is rule out as many possibilities as possible, and then what is left must be the most reasonable expectation of what is true or the best representation of what's true. So you'll never know 100% certainty, but to answer your specific question, the best evidence that we have indicates the universe is 13.798 billion years old, and we have an uncertainty in that age as if I, I said to you, I know what hour you were born. Not what year, not what month, not what day, but what hour you were born. That's how precisely we know the properties of the infant and the uh, aged universe. That's wow. quite astounding. It's, yeah. quite it's, astounding. A, it's a new era in humanity. And there's Never a lot of conversation, that. which I'm going to go to this later, because yeah. really and truly, there's a lot of conversation about the universe and black holes and all things. That's right. But I'm going to go to a little, <laughs> bit, a little bit someplace else where we can take a, mm -hmm. a pause. The sun is so big, believe it this or not, it is the size of one million Earths. Mm -hmm. That's like amazing. <laughs> Inside, that's yes. pretty astounding. Mm -hmm. But is that sun is our largest star? I don't think so. No, it's not. It's not by so a long what's shot. what's the biggest star? So there are very, very large stars. There's a star that's a very famous star. It had a movie named after it called Betelgeuse, Betelgeuse. Um, <laughs> that's a star in the constellation Orion. It's quite massive. And when stars get older, like many of us, they start to put on weight. They put on size, if you will. They expand. Yeah. And this star in particular is a very reddish star. You can see in the winter when we do our next event, you know, perhaps, you can see it in the winter. It's quite a jewel of a ruby put, type by color. By the way, I want to pause for a second. Yeah. We put telescopes all along the mountains at yeah. a certain time of the year. When it's we, quite it's spe quite spectacular. Quite interesting. So when you, when you look at the star, it's enormous, and you can actually determine that its size is somewhere, something like 50 times the diameter of our sun, which is, as you said, 100 times the diameter of the Earth. Yeah. It's talking about you know, 5,000 times, and then you have to cube that to get oh the number. Oh, my so we're looking at stars that are much more massive much and more massive. these interesting objects are called they black hot? holes. They are not as hot. So this is colder. It's a oh, colder yeah. oh, star. So they're older? Cools off. It gets older yeah. and ages. And this star in particular, Betelgeuse, we think will explode and create a devastating supernova with spraying out debris that will then later form planets and star systems perhaps beautiful spots, but not here. You heard this at the Golden <laughs> Dome. <laughs> That's right. I just want everybody but I have to tell you, it's, it's a million years from now. Okay, so good. So keep eating healthily We don't have to worry, here. ladies. Yes. We don't have to worry. That's this is right. on another watch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a new James Webb That's right. telescope. telescope that mm -hmm. launches, is still launching. If they're building it. They're, they're constructing building it. They're it. looking at 2018. It's one of the world's most so expensive tel telescopes. Exactly. So mm -hmm. I, we'd love to hear about that. I yeah. Mean, 
like we get to hear this first too. In 2018, <laughs> this giant, very expensive telescope That's correct. is being launched to do what? So this telescope will be the successor to the Hubble telescope. So you may remember there was a telescope launched in the 90s called the Hubble Space Telescope. It was the telescope. first telescope. Yeah. It really was interesting because it was a spy satellite type technology that instead of looking down, they turned it around and made it look out. And that gave us the deepest glimpses of many important things that had never been seen by human eyes. Um, or human computers, if you will, and then we translate it into, into data that we can visualize. What, what this next project will do is a worthy successor that's many times bigger, and, in, uh, and with telescopes, the bigger the better. Uh, if you have a telescope that's twice as, as wide as another telescope, that telescope will be four times more powerful. It's the square of the, of the size of the telescope that matters. This telescope, I believe, is going to be something like three to five times bigger than the Hubble telescope. Wow. We'll be able to see nine to wow. 25 times deeper into the universe. Wow. It's just spectacular. Which there's some pretty spectacular pictures that came out of the Hubble, that's for yes, sure. Yes, yes. I mean, we... Oh, my gosh. So if you could invent a telescope, <coughs> what would you invent? So I tried to invent... <laughs> I did invent the telescope. I know. Another, so yes, you did yeah. another one. What's mm -hmm. your wish? What's on your wish list? Yeah, so my, my bucket list or light bucket uh, for telescopes. What, what I really want to see now, what I'm fascinated with, is whether or not we can know what the universe was like, not in the first minute of its existence, not in the first second, but the first trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second. So oh, a one following 35 zeros. What's <coughs> going so, on, by the way? This is really stuff that's I'm happening. building this in my laboratory right. at UC San Diego. This is real, right? It's amazing. So what we're able to do with this Is that hard? I mean, is it, you, you obviously hard. get grants. I have, I have 21 people that work with me on this oh. project. People, eight of them are getting their PhDs, their wow. doctorate degrees, and they're going to be professional astrophysicists, be professors like me someday. Mm -hmm. Others that are that are going to be engineers and scientists, uh, and maybe in different disciplines. We run the gamut from 18-year-olds all the way up to you know 50, 60-year-olds that so are going back. This must back be very exciting for you. It is. That's the best part of the job. I get to interface with the smartest people, young men and women, and get to have, you know, play a small role and, and be around their 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 brilliance. Because you learn more from uh, from students than you do. From uh, well, they're inquisitive. Is always so wonderful. That's so right. what's your timing to complete this project? So we just received a $40 million grant wow. to build this new observatory upgrade, <coughs> which is going to be called the Simons Observatory. Mm -hmm. It's going to be an array of telescopes, uh, little sentinels, not little actually, they're going to be at least 11 and a half feet across, and there's going to be about six of them, all in the Atacama Desert of northern Chile that you mentioned, the world's highest observatory array. And this will be at 17,000 feet above half the atmosphere of the Earth. And we do that, as you said, we want to get away from, I'd love to build a telescope here so I don't have to go so far away and stay at the Golden Door. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but instead, we need to be above as much water vapor as possible. As you mentioned, we want to be in a desert. The driest desert on Earth is the Atacama Desert. And so we're going there. We're going to build this telescope that there, and it's going to see so things we've never seen before. Oh, my gosh. Like <laughs> what? What, we, what are you looking so for? So these, these properties of what the universe's dark matter is made of. Mm -hmm. We are made of matter. We're made of, I always say, proto uh, protons neutrons, croutons, you know, if you, had, if, if you eat like I do. <coughs> and, and, but that's just the tip of the iceberg, literally. What we are made of is not representative of the rest of the world, of the rest of the universe. The matter and the energy in the rest of the universe, 96% of it is not like us. It's a dark matter and a dark energy, and we don't know what it is. Our idea and our job is to test what it's made up of, what's going to happen to the universe, and what it was like in its earliest moments. Wow. Wow, right? Yeah, wow. it's really exciting. So I want to switch subjects to a little bit and talk a little bit. It's a lot of conversation. Mm -hmm. Why so much conversation about black holes today? Well, so You know, it's a lot. Yeah, there is. And actually what happened between the last time that I was here several months ago and today was a discovery in February um, of the first direct detection of what are called waves of gravity, gravitational waves. These gravitational waves are like waves of light or waves on a water. They're created by the motion of matter. And in this case, the matter that was creating these waves and ripples in space-time were originating from the collision of two of the most massive objects in the universe called black holes. Not one black hole, two black holes spiraling around each other in a death dance that lasted perhaps thousands and thousands of years and in the last microseconds collided together and exploded not with light because they're not made of matter they're not light or ordinary luminous matter they annihilated themselves and produced gravitational waves wow. cra you know, cra uh, crashing through space and time and we detected them on earth not me personally but a group called the LIGO experiment and it's a detector 
which is not unlike when Galileo invented the telescope, or used the telescope for astronomical purposes. He was able to see further than any other person in history at that time. Now we're seeing a whole new wavelength of open to the imagination. Well, explain just for my guests for a moment. Like, I'm gonna ask a really kind of odd <laughs> question. <laughs> okay. It not only explains sort of a black hole, yeah. but what if I fell into a black hole? Mm. What yes. if I just was walking along and so, yeah. there was a black <laughs> hole and I fell into it? Right. What would I be so, falling into? So black holes are, are some of the most uh, bizarre objects known to the, to the human mind. They were really predicted as a consequence, and nobody took it seriously, of Einstein's theory. And it's a place where the rules change dramatically. So when you try to get from point A to point B near a black hole, it can take you extremely longer. And to the outside world though, you will seem to freeze in what your last moments were according to them. Life will go on for you for a little while until you get, your, your feet will experience so much more gravitational pull from the center of the black hole that they'll rip apart from your head, well, which will feel slightly less. That's very so we have a very poetic name that for that. Be bad, it's right? called spaghettification. Oh, so there you, go. you get turned into basically a strand a of human spaghetti. Oh yes, exactly. Gosh. Something to avoid at all costs. It's one way to get thin. But yeah. in this case, yeah, yeah, you want to yeah. avoid it. You can only do it once. Oh my gosh. <laughs> what is string theory? String theory is Can't another. I know this question, yeah, right? String. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody heard of string theory? <laughs> yeah, that's right. The Big Bang Theory. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, so string theory is, some people think, a form of mathematical knowledge that doesn't belong in the 21st century. It actually, really, we don't understand it yet, and we won't understand it until the 22nd century. And only, only by really trying to tease out whether or not it makes predictions that we can test. So Einstein, in the 1900s, 100 years ago this year, exactly 100 years ago this year, created a theory that describes black holes, the expansion Incredible. of the universe, and how Incredible. galaxies even. So all, this, all these laws were 100 years ago. Now we're looking at physics perhaps of a second, the 22nd century. Um, to understand it will mean a unification of the laws that govern what Einstein discovered, gravity, waves of light, waves of gravity, <coughs> and the unification of the very smallest things in the universe, quarks, and protons, electrons, so-called quantum theory. So string theory was one of Einstein's uh, attempts to do what, what Einstein couldn't do, to combine all the laws of physics into one law, preferably one that will fit on a t-shirt, like oh Sheldon God. likes to wear. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> You're studying and researching time. Yes. That's so interesting. Yeah. So it, 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 tell us what that means. Yeah, so, so time to me is, is, this, you know, is this miracle. It's, you know, some people say it's the thing that prevents everything from happening at once. Uh, some say it's, the, you know, it's, it's what happens when we're not paying attention. But, but as I said, we have agency. We can move left and right, up and down, back and forth. But, and Einstein said space and time are two sides of the same coin. There's something called space time, and it's really, he made it one word. And it, it was meant to, to unify the fabric of the cosmos, which is a name of a wonderful book about the subject by Brian Greene, another mm -hmm. more well-known Brian uh, in cosmology. But, uh, but, the, but what the essence of the connectivity between space and time is, is fascinating to me. And why is it that you, you, know, that you never see uh, you know, a, a coffee cup that has cream and coffee in it? Why do you never see it get unmixed into cream on top and coffee on the bottom? There seems to be a directivity, a direction, a one-way valve that time can only flow in one direction. But I, I, I ask you to think about this. If you've ever seen a grandfather clock, if you've ever seen one, you'll see the face of it and you'll see a pendulum swinging back and forth. Ignore the clock face itself. Think about the pendulum itself only. It's swinging back and forth. Imagine you make a movie of that pendulum swinging tick-tock, tick-tock, back and forth. You can't tell which direction that movie is playing, can you? You can't tell if the thing started off to the left right, or to the right. right. You wouldn't know. So the laws of physics, the gravitational laws, the electricity laws, the quantum laws, they are agnostic about the direction of time. It could be that time can go backwards and forwards. Interesting. Our experience <laughs> is time goes in one direction only. Right. I want to know why that is. Interesting. Oh my God, that'll be another interview. That <laughs> cannot be for tonight. There's a, I mean, obviously there's been a lot of conversation about time travel. Correct. And I'm sure that's going to be part of your research. <laughs> that's right, yes. And, you're, and how telescopes are really time machines. They are. Because you're going backwards in that, that in that's the right. way you look through and you're reversing time. The farther time. you can see, the farther back in time you can see. There's the thing called the Kepler mission. Yes. Have there been any, I think it just, it's new. Yeah. 
What's interesting? What have they discovered, though? The Kepler mission is a, a very interesting telescope in space that was set to look at a constellation that will be there in about right. an hour or two. Um, and this constellation is just an ordinary patch of the sky to the, to the human eye or even to an ordinary telescope. What they did is they looked for the properties of the light that we receive from distant stars with the, with the hope that they would see the dimming of that star when a planet eclipses that sun, that distant sun. And they do, in fact, detect the presence of thousands, literally, I think they're up to about 3,000 what are called exoplanets, planets that are outside of our solar system. So these are planets that we didn't know about until 1992 or 1993. That was the first time a planet outside our solar system was discovered using a slightly different technique, but the Kepler mission has now vastly, as Copernicus did, has increased, if you will, the landscape in which the universe has unfolded. And in our case, in some ways, it makes us significant in that we know that we're life and we're right. intelligent life. Perhaps some of those thousands, and, and there could be trillions of planets Trilli in the universe. Trillions. So this is now un... un so, so that sort of asked the question then. Yeah. How, we're obviously, it's not, it doesn't seem logical that we could be completely alone. It seems like it wouldn't it just, be. It yes. just seems not logical. <clears throat> There's a, a wonderful movie called Contact with yeah. Jodie yeah, Foster. Yeah, yeah, of and course. Jodie's character is based on a real scientist, a friend of mine named Jill Tarter, who yeah. operates the SETI Institute in, in Silicon Valley. And uh, she says in that movie, uh, it was taken from a book by Carl Sagan, she said, you know, if we are the only species that evolved in the universe, it's an awful waste of space. Yeah, like a <laughs> massive amount of space, <laughs> yes, right? So I'm going right. to switch gears a bit. What do you think about space tourism? Uh, space tourism is really exciting. I've just, that's what everybody's <laughs> talking about. That's right. So the, there's two golden doors now currently, right? So <laughs> you want to expand. One's on an asteroid. <laughs> we get you on an asteroid. That's right. Yeah, I think uh, I always wanted to be an astronaut. Uh, that's what I wanted to do. And I you know, kind of missed the cut off the space shuttle. Darn. But now with this possibility, you know, if I if I scrimp and save my pennies, you know, perhaps I could be a space tourist. So one of my friends, you know, who's, who's just a, like a normal professor, he's not you know millionaire. He put down the deposit. He found a way to do it, and that's his dream. And oh Elon gosh. Musk, you know, a wonderful yeah. creative he's genius. He's determined. He's determined. He said that I he would wants. Go. He would wants go? to die. Would go? Yeah. <laughs> I would go. Elon has said that he wants to die on Mars. Well, I don't know about yeah. that. That's a little dry. Well, I don't want to die on impact. Right. You know, I don't yeah, want no, to no. impact Mars. No, no, so I just no. want to go up and come back. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's really quite a mm -hmm. popular astrophysicist. Yes. I mean, he is like a movie star yeah. of physics. Oh, he's a rock star. Yeah. He is. Yeah. He's like, that's you want right. to be a rock I'm star. I'm jealous of him. He, he should be. This yeah. guy's <laughs> like, you research, he's everywhere. Never heard of him before today, but he's pretty <laughs> popular. Yes, he is. He observed that the NASA annual budget is a half a penny of tax dollars. That's correct. one of his comments, a half a penny. Mm -hmm. And that if it just went to a full penny, we would be able to make massive positive results mm -hmm. in the not only the economy and the world. That's right. Do you feel that this has de-escalated over the years as far as investing in this yeah, space? Yeah, I, I, unfortunately I think that's true. You know, I always say that nobody wakes up in the morning, you know, I mean, they might feel this way about, you know, uh, this person running for president or senator, but they never wake up and say, I hate astronomers, you know, they're awful, they're, uh, Brian Keating, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah. But, but astronomy it inspires and it's, it's what, you know, if you think about what a country is supposed to do, it's supposed to have the ability to protect its citizens and and to and to develop uh, an environment where the things that are worth protecting are preserved. And in my case, I think that's arts, and and I also think that's science, and not just pure technology. I think technology is wonderful. We have fast cell phones, and a lot of the technology, by the way, came about due to research in pure science. So trying to build a radio telescope led to the cell phone. That's yes. another discussion, but that actually is is the case. Um, and so, from my perspective, the dividends that you get. Um, from doing something in science, pure science, uh, building a particle accelerator, led to the creation of the entire internet, which you can then use so for perhaps commerce. it's moving to private industry. It, it may you know what be. I'm saying? I don't think that the industry, you know, private industry can really have the profit motive, though. Yeah. Uh, these people like Musk and, and Peter Diamandis and, and others. <clears throat> um, they have a profit motive, and that's the view of sustainability. But in a lot of cases, we have a National Science Foundation. We, as you said, if you translate a half a penny, the other statistic that you know to keep in mind is you know many of you use lipstick. So the annual expenditures on lipstick in America out outspend what NASA gets in its budget. And and yet, if you thought about right, it, you think one less lipstick. <laughs> <that's right. laughs> uh, the if you thought about you know how much money NASA must get until you knew those statistics, you might think, oh, it's so much more, because it does it so does, much more. Yeah. 
But it's so, yes, it is a little disappointing, but it's not just disappointing because I won't get to do my pet project. Thank goodness private foundations like the Simons Foundation have stepped up, as I said, $40 million for basic science. No, that has no, no need for a profit you know, motive associated with it. So that's, that's been a challenge. That definitely has in the last, in the last decade. Well, uh, at the end of all of our interviews, we try to make this interview fun and cover time machines and <laughs> asteroids and black holes in space without getting into too much theorem and mathematics. But at the end of all of our interviews, and Dr. Brian Keating is a great friend, I hope if you have time to sit with him and ask him questions, at, at the end of this, I hope you do, because he is just a rock star in this world. We all, you know where I'm going, of course. <laughs> yeah, I think so, yeah. yes. We always ask our guests to, you did? Well, I didn't. Thought about to give our guest <laughs> a golden nugget, some piece of information <coughs> or something that you can take with him. We've had wonderful go golden nuggets <laughs> throughout the year, so mm -hmm. you uh, get to do this again with us. Yeah. What would be your golden nugget for our guest tonight? I always think, you know, this is astrology week and people get interested in astrology and it's inevitable that you think about the biggest questions um, when you think about things like what I study. So I get paid to think about what the universe was like in the earliest moments. And it's so wonderful, but many people didn't really get a chance to do that since college, right? In college, you were on the dorm room couch, you're thinking about talking in the bowl session at night. I want people to think about that. I want them to have that sense of wonder and to really look into these things and, and not just say, oh, that's for the eggheads, that's for the, the people like, like Brian and his students. No, it's for everybody. The universe belongs to everybody. Yeah, I agree. It belongs to everybody.